Hello, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast put on by three classical dude, three classy dudes, uh, all talking. I well, probably can't say that. I can't say classy. I'm. I don't think that's an. We are the Adjective classiest that could be used for me. <clears throat> what um, by one classy dude, Graham Donaldson, and the two of us, AJ my and dearest Magby. bros. I'm, yes, I'm okay with that. Sounds I would good. accept that description. Anyway, um, at, if you're dialing in for the first time. This is I'm welcome. Glad to have you here. Buckle up. Buckle up for knowledge, as we say at the beginning of every podcast. Guys, I actually don't know what we're talking about today, but I know AJ is the one talking about it. I'm looking at a piece of paper that says first year slash winter. So we're talking about the seasons today. That's not true. Yeah, I mean, we could. Do you, you really want to talk to? about the class? No, I really don't want to. Although, so boring. It is kind of, I mean, we've probably talked about this on the podcast before, but the medievals saw time as a circle more than they did see it as linear. Like, I think we've talked about that, similar right? Similar to Matthew McConaughey in time is a season, flat circle. season one of True Detective. <laughs> True Detective. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yes. Season three is coming out. I'm so when, I've never watched any of those episodes. Mm. So I've only winter, seen the meme. Yeah. Sorry. I've only seen the meme. Sorry. What are... AJ, what are you actually talking about today? Today, I'm actually talking about a fella named Pericles. I'm only sort of talking about Pericles okay. and the Athenians. So I'm going to give us some like vague background that <laughs> awesome. is not super thorough. Good. And then we're going to talk about That's the best kind. a speech that he gave. Cool. So, All the funeral oration? Yeah. yeah, yeah. For your lovers of the good? Oh, man. You have it in front of you. All right. So and Pericles I was... It memorized. Not anymore, I don't think. Oh. We are lovers of the good. Yeah, yet simple in our tastes, and we cultivate the mind without loss of manliness. Wealth, wealth we employ, we employ, not for talk, talk or ostentation, or ostentation but, but when, when there's, there's a real use for it. To avow, to avow poverty, poverty with, with us is no disgrace. The true disgrace is doing, doing nothing, nothing to, to avoid, avoid it. it. Yep. Okay, so that's in the, in the speech I'm going to talk about today. So Pericles was a guy, he was born around 495 B.C., uh, kind of at the height of the Athenian Empire. So at this point, Athens had a whole lot of land. They were kind of in charge of a lot of stuff. And he was there during the uh, the Peloponnesian Wars, mm. which was when Athens and Sparta got into sort of a tiff and Sparta eventually subjugated Athens. It didn't really go well for Athens. They, they This was the fall of the Athenian Empire and they never kind of regained their previous glory. You probably shouldn't take a fight with a civilization whose Built sole around. business of existing is to like throw down. Yeah. Yeah, you'd think. Yeah. You'd think that'd be like day one stuff. Like they're like, who should we pick a fight with? Not Sparta. It's like, That's we're the school ones, and they're the beat up ones. Let's go take them Let's on. Let's go take them on. Yeah, yeah. It seems like a bad idea. It's <laughs> and it it's was. like the uh, the tennis team taking on the football team. <laughs> That's good. It's just. I guess it depends what the, what game they're playing, right? Like if they're playing them in tennis, fights. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> poorly. Fight. Very game. poorly. Yeah. All right, so he he was a general, and he was a politician. He was born kind of wealthy, so he had time to pursue education. And he rose in the ranks of, you know, just fame in Athens and advocated for populist policies. So he was for the people. He advocated for true democracy. There are some people after his life that said the true democracy he advocated for actually ended up being the fall of Athens. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of things that contributed to the fall of Athens, not just taking on Sparta. Taking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Taking on Sparta seems like a more yeah. important piece of this sure. than just advocating for populist stuff. But the, the rule was that kind of where he went, everyone followed. He was a great speaker. He was a charismatic person. He fought hard and it's not like just he was he was a speaker he was also a general and fought in all of the wars that he you know planned so he was a strategist a general a speaker he was incredible they say that when he spoke he would carry the crowd along with him and harness the thunder and lightning of athens like he was supposed to be this amazing speaker and he you know that way rallied troops and had this program of war that was basically like don't pick any fights we can't win and we're just going to try to wear them all down like just when they're attacking some strongholds we're going to go and just mess with their farms and eventually wear them all down in the end athens lost its po previous power but you know he he was a piece of the good fighting anyway the, the piece i'm going to read you today it's that's really what i'm concerned with is this piece of literature and I, I have copied it from the landmark Thucydides, uh, edited by Robert B. Strassler, and has an introduction by a fellow named Victor Davis Hanson. You have that book too, or did you borrow that one mine? Uh, I have the book too. Oh, cool. Yeah, you have the other landmark. landmark. I've got both of them. I've got Thucydides, and uh, I've got two of them. What's the other landmark? Landmark something? Uh -oh. I got it as a gift. What What are these books? Are they just collections of mm -hmm. s speeches and writings and... 
things like that? No. So Thucydides was the sort of foremost historian of the Peloponnesian War. So this is like, they're saying this is the, the Thucydides. So it's two books that are collections of Thucydides' writings? The second one is a landmark somebody else. Somebody else. Okay. Yeah. So it's not both Thucydides. I think this one is just the history of the Peloponnesian War. Cool. But after the first year of the war, right, of, of true war with Sparta, at a an assembly of people there to celebrate the fallen soldiers that had died during the war of Athens, he gets up to give this speech. Now, Who, Pericles? A, a guy named Pericles, this speaker, this general. Thucydides was just the historian. The guy writing it down. The guy yeah. live blogging. The guy, yes. the guy, yeah, the guy live blogging all, all of thing. it. And it's tradition and we'll get there. But remember, these are not Pericles' true words. That isn't recorded. Uh, th- this is sort of through th- the mouth of Thucydides. So Thucydides is the actual writer. He says, I tried my best to write it as, as Pericles would have said it. I tried to remember as best I could the actual content of the speech, but this is not word for word Pericles. This is Pericles filtered through the historian Thucydides. True. Children, if you want supreme cosmic power, be a historian. Because? Because you get to like craft history. <laughs> Right? Like, Thucydides uh-huh. gets to write the speech himself, and he's like, oh, yeah, Pericles said it. Or you, or you get to listen to this awesome speech, and then you get to take all the cool parts that you like and write and, it down and all the parts you didn't really pay attention and to, those. Yeah. and you forget those. And, and people then, you're jealous of, you can call them dunderheads, and they yeah. can't. Like, you're the one writing it down. And that's the and record. Then, yeah. And then it's what we teach to our kids. Yeah. There you go. The other fun thing is I Life found advice. out. Be a historian. When Pericles was born... His mom, the night before, dreamt she had given birth to a lion. Oh, oh wow. Dang. Which could be, you know, lions are awesome. Yeah. Or it could be a reference to Pericles' unnaturally large head. Mm-hmm. They actually mm-hmm. called him Squill Head Seriously? after the Squill Onion. Because he had a big old head? He had a big old poor round oh, onion-like head. I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. That's a bummer. <laughs> okay. What I wanted to do was, I know last time we read a lot of heaven and hell and i'm sorry i I don't like to read full texts on this thing but this one's shorter it's a speech and it's a really good speech and i thought i would give you guys the feeling of hearing it from pericles at the funeral so if you're sitting in your car yeah that's what i'm doing if you're sitting in your car like settle in you are here they gather they would gather all the bones of the men who had fallen into this public burial place and then they would give a great speech. You know, this is a this is a tradition. There's someone to, there that shows up and their duty is to honor the dead that have fallen in support of their state. Remember, at this point, your city is pretty much your state, your country, right? Athens is a city-state and you are for your city. It'd be like Austin, right? Somebody just coming and speaking for the dead of Austin who have died to protect our way of life, right? Our our weirdness. Our tacos. Yeah, our tacos, right? They died to protect our way of the taco. Oh. And... So there's, there are mourning families, there are mourning children, there are children who've lost their parents, there are parents who've lost their children, and it is a kind of a sour time. And then the person that gets up to give the speech is the general, one of the generals that has been leading the war, and he has these things to say. Most of my predecessors in this place have commended him who made this speech part of the law, telling us that it is well that it should be delivered at the burial of those who fall in battle. For myself, I should have thought that the worth which had displayed itself in deeds would be sufficiently rewarded by honors also shown by deeds, such as you now see in this funeral prepared at the people's cost. And I could have wished that the reputations of many brave men were not to be imperiled in the mouth of a single individual to stand or fall according as he spoke well or ill. For it is hard to speak properly upon a subject where it is even difficult to convince your hearers that you are speaking the truth. On the one hand, the friend who is familiar with every fact of the story may think that some point has not been set forth with that fullness which he wishes and knows it to deserve. On the other, who he who is a stranger to the matter may be led by envy to suspect exaggeration if he hears anything above his own nature. For men can endure to hear others praised only so long as they can severally persuade themselves of their own ability to equal the actions recounted. When this point is passed, envy comes in and with it, incredulity. However, since our ancestors have stamped this custom with their approval, it becomes my duty to obey the law and try to satisfy your several wishes and opinions as best I may. So what's he saying there? Is he saying like, I don't, for men can endure to hear others praised only so long as they can severally 
uh, severally persuade themselves of their own ability to equal the actions recounted. So if I if I praise these men too much, you know, no one's going to buy it. You yeah, and if I praise them too little, their friends will be like, oh, I didn't praise enough. Yeah. So you have to hit this weird sweet spot right in the middle where people are going to believe the things you say. So you can't be hyperbolic and everyone's going to be like, yeah, he really didn't know Charles because Charles wasn't that good. Yeah, I, I actually think about this a lot when I write in the books of students when, you know, we, we give them prizes and mm-hmm. little books as prizes and I have to be careful not to overpraise them and they're like, I didn't do any of the homework or mm-hmm. underpraise them. You, you know, you have to be really careful what you say about the student. So... I shall begin with our ancestors. It is both just and proper that they should have the honor of the first mention on an occasion like the present. They dwelt in the country without break in the succession from generation to generation and handed it down free to the present time by their valor. And if our more remote ancestors deserve praise, much more do our own fathers, who added to their inheritance the empire which we now possess and spared no gains to be able to leave their acquisitions to us of the present generation. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Pops. Lastly, there are a few parts of our dominions that have not been augmented by those of us here, who are still more or less in the vigor of life, while the mother country has been furnished by us with everything that can enable her to depend on her own resources, whether for war or for peace. That part of our history, which tells of the military achievements, which gave us our several possessions, or of the ready valor with which either we or our fathers stemmed the tide of Hellenic or foreign aggression, is a theme too familiar to hear, or sorry, too familiar to my hearers for me to dwell upon, and I shall pass it by. But what was the road by which we reached our position? What the form of government under which our greatness grew? What the national habits out of which it sprang? These are questions which I may try to solve before I proceed to my eulogy upon these men, since I think this to be a subject upon which the present occasion a speaker may properly dwell, and to which the whole assemblage, whether citizens or foreigners, may listen with advantage. So the speech will eventually get to these people who died and the battle they lost, which just from what your intro was saying is like a significant loss to the city of Athens. Yeah. But before he does that, he's going to talk about why the city got great in the first place. Yes. Am I getting this right? Yeah. He's going to, he's going to talk about their way of life and you'll find this. uh, Well, I'll leave analysis to a little bit later, even though, well, I'll be curious later. Didn't you say that their way of life might've led to their failure the implementation of populism. That's what some critics of his have said. And then others have said that was the great strength Overstated of Athens. Or, okay. Right. Sure. I mean, so you got to be on brand with your speech. Like you gotta, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a funny thing about his, his speech. He's clearly a general that is rah, rah Athens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, our constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring States. We are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves. Oh yeah. It's administration favors the many instead of the few. This is why it is called a democracy. If we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all in their private differences. If, to social standing, advancement in public life falls to reputation for capacity, class considerations not being allowed to interfere with merit, nor again does poverty bar the way, if a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. Basically, poor folks can do stuff too. Mm Mm-hmm. The freedom which we enjoy in our government extends also to our ordinary life. There, far from exercising a jealous surveillance over each other, we do not feel called upon to be angry with our neighbor for doing what he likes, or even to indulge in those injurious looks which cannot fail to be offensive, although they inflict no real harm. (laughs) But all this ease in our private relations does not make us lawless as citizens. Against this fear is our chief safeguard. Uh, Sorry, against this, fear is our chief safeguard teaching us to obey the magistrates and the laws, particularly such as regard the protection of the injured, whether they are actually on the statute book book, or belong to that code which, although unwritten, yet cannot be broken without an acknowledged disgrace. Further, we provide plenty of means for the mind to refresh itself from business. We celebrate games and sacrifice all the year round, and the elegance of our private establishments forms a daily source of pleasure and helps to distract us from the causes, from what causes us distress. While the magnitude of our city draws the produce of the world into our harbor so that, the Athe- so that to the Athenian, the fruits of other countries are as familiar a luxury as those of his own. Athens sounds kind of awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If we tune- turn to our military policy, there also we differ from our antagonists. We throw open our city to the world and never by alien acts exclude foreigners from any opportunity of learning or observing, although the eyes of an enemy may occasionally profit by our liberality. 
trusting less in system and policy than to the native spirit of our citizens. While in education, where our rivals from their very cradles, by a painful discipline, seek manliness. I think this is a little jab at Sparta. Well, this whole affair goes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At Athens, we live exactly as we please, and yet are just as ready to encounter every legitimate danger. I mean... But apparently not. Yeah, I mean, it's all well and good, but they did lose the the war, the fight. I mean, not yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. In proof of this, it may be noticed that the Spartans did not do not invade our country alone, but bring with them all their confederates, <laughs> while we Athenians advance unsupported okay. into the territory of a neighbor. Great. And fighting upon a foreign soil usually vanquish with ease the men who are defending their homes. Our united force was never yet encountered by any enemy, because we have at once to attend to our marine and to dispatch our citizens by land upon a hundred different services, so that wherever they engage with some such faction of our strength, a success against the detachment is magnified into a victory over the nation, and a defeat into a reverse suffered at the hands of our entire people. You guys catch that? Basically, there we divide our army into little chunks. Mm. And so whenever somebody loses to us, they're like, oh, we got beat by the whole st- country of Athens. And then if they win, they're like, we totally smoked all of Athens, but it's really just divided. Smaller groups. Yeah. And yet, if with habits not of labor, but of ease and courage, not of art, but of nature, we are still willing to encounter danger. We have the double advantage of not suffering hardships before we need to and of placing them in the hour of need as fearlessly as those who are never free from them. Nor are these the only points in which our city is worthy of admiration. So, so far we've talked about how the laws are equitable, like poor people mm-hmm. aren't excluded, and we got a pretty decent army, but we don't have to kill ourselves to be good at fighting. Right. And yeah. then here's the passage that we memorized, although it's a different translation. Yeah. We cultivate refinement without extravagance and knowledge without effeminacy. <laughs> Wealth we employ more for use than for show and place the real disgrace of poverty not in owning to the fact, but in declining the struggle against it. So good. Our public men have, besides politics, their private affairs to attend to. And our ordinary citizens, though occupied with the pursuits of industry, are still fair judges of public matters. For unlike any other nation, we regard the citizen who takes no part in these duties not as unambitious, but as useless. Wow. And we are able to judge proposals even if we cannot originate them. Instead of looking on a discussion as a stumbling block in the way of action, we think it an indispensable preliminary to any wise action at all. I think that's kind of another jab at Sparta saying, they don't talk about the stuff before they do it. We think discussion necessary so that we don't do stupid stuff. Again, in our enterprises, we present the singular spectacle of daring and deliberation, each carried to its highest point and both united in the same persons. Although with the rest of mankind's decision is the fruit of ignorance, hesitation of reflection. But the prize for courage, so he's saying like when, for most of people, when they are courageous, it's because they haven't been thinking. And if they are cowardly, it's because they've been reflecting on their place. But for us, we discuss, we reflect, and yet we still dare dare danger. But the prize for courage will surely be awarded most justly to those who best know the difference between hardship and pleasure and yet are never tempted to shrink from danger. In generosity, we are equaling, equally singular, acquiring our friends by conferring not by receiving favors. Yet, of course, the doer of the favor is the firmer friend of the two, in order by continued kindness to keep the recipient in his debt, while the debtor feels less keenly from the very consciousness that the return he makes will be a payment, not a free gift. And it is only the Athenians who, fearless of consequences, confer their benefits not from calculations of expediency, but in the confidence of liberality. In short, I say that as a city, we are the school of Hellas, which I think means Greece. While I doubt if the world can produce a man who, where he has only himself to depend upon, is equal to so many emergencies and graced by so happy a versatility as the Athenian. And that this is no mere boast thrown out for the occasion, but plain matter of fact, is proved by the power of the state acquired by these habits. For Athens alone of her contemporaries is found when tested to be greater than her reputation, and alone gives no occasion to her assailants to blush at the antagonist by whom they have been worsted, or to her subjects to question her title to rule of merit, to rule by merit. Rather, the admiration of the present and succeeding ages will be ours, since we have not left our power without witness, but have shown it by mighty proofs, and far from needing a Homer for our eulogist, 
or other of his craft whose verses might charm for the moment only for the impression which they gave to melt at the touch of fact, we have forced every sea and land to be the highway of our daring, and everywhere, whether for evil or for good, have left imperishable monuments behind us. Such is the Athens for which these men, in the assertion of their resolve not to lose her, nobly fought and died, and may well every one of their survivors be ready to suffer in her cause. All right, you guys following so far? Yeah, that's um, that line, we have forced every sea and land to be the highway of our daring. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and the... And we don't want to be immortalized in poets and poems because they can lie? Is that what he's saying? Or they can lie or they can Well, sort what of... happens is their, their verses sound real nice, and then when facts come up, the poetry melts away. Mm. But he's like, we don't, we don't need Homer to dress us up. We mm-hmm. are good enough without the poetry. Mm-hmm. And the p- people we rule never... We don't give them any reason to doubt us when we rule, and the people we have bested, right, um, they, they don't blush at yeah. having lost to us because we are so powerful. And he said this earlier in the oration, but that the spe- part of the reason for the speech is that people can live up to what he's describing here. So, I don't know. I don't know. What, in some way, these deaths aren't in vain because they will promote this activity in the people who are listening to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, like, he has set himself as saying, I'm making an accurate description of people. This is how people can be. And then goes, and then tells people who they should be. I'm just, I'm reflecting that like my, my reaction to most of these things is to be like, actually that's wrong or actually that's overblown. And like, that's the problem that I just can't take in and say, no, actually we can be this awesome of people. So I want to, I want to, I have some questions to ask at the end of this. Uh, yep. We have, I don't know, maybe a page. Yep, we can keep going. Page and a half left. Two, two and a half, two and a half pages, something like that. It's not too long, listener, I promise. Stay with us. Uh, indeed, if I have dwelt at some length upon the character of our country, it has been to show that our stake in the struggle is not the same as theirs who have no such blessings to lose. And also that the eulogy of the men over whom I am now speaking might be by definite proofs established. That eulogy is now in a great measure complete, for the Athens that I have celebrated is only what the heroism of these and their like have made her. Men whose fame, unlike that of most Hellenes, will be found to be no greater than what they deserve. And if a test of worth be wanted, it is to be found in their closing scene, and this not only in the cases in which it is set the final seal upon their merit, um, but also in those in which it gave the first intimation of their having any. So basically, if, they are, if we want to test to see if they're worthy, well, part of it is that they died for their country. Yeah. For there is justice in the claim that steadfastness in the, his country's battles should be as a cloak to cover a man's other imperfections, since the good action has blotted out the bad, and his merit as a citizen more than outweighed his demerits as an individual. But none of these allowed their either their sorry, but none of these allowed either wealth with its proper sorry, prospect of future enjoyment to unnerve his spirit, or poverty with its hope of a day of freedom and riches to tempt him shrink from danger. Basically, rich guys didn't balk because they had stuff to lose, and poor people didn't balk because they may someday enjoy wealth. That's no, quite the claim. For there is justice in the claim that steadfastness, steadfastness in his country's battle should be as a cloak to cover a man's other imperfections. Since the good action has blotted out the bad, and his merits as a citizen more than outweighed his demerits as an individual. Yeah. Do you think that claim would... I don't know if that claim flies today. I feel like people like finding people's demerits as an individual outweigh their, their uh, merits as a citizen. Like if someone serves the country or dies in battle or uh, um, has sort of a heroic um, stance for the benefit of everybody else, people are going to like dredge up old tweets and be like, yeah, but he said mean things once. I don't know. It's quite the... Uh, of course. Y- yes, I agree with that. And that was a piece of the the snark episode before of there's something in us that wants to tear down things that like are good in a majority of cases, but bad in only a few things. Yeah. So I don't know what that is. Answer that. What, what is it, AJ? We'll find out in the rest of this paper, won't we? Yep. Okay. No, holding that vengeance upon their enemies was more to be desired than any personal blessings, and reckoning this to be the most glorious of hazards, they joyfully determined to accept the risk, to make sure of their vengeance, and to let their wishes wait, 
And while committing to hope the uncertainty of final success, in the business before them, they fought, or sorry, they thought fit to act boldly and trust in themselves. Thus, choosing to die resisting rather than to live submitting, they fled only from dishonor, but met danger face to face. And after one brief moment, while at the summit of their fortune, left behind them not their fear, but their glory. So died these men as became Athenians. You, their survivors, must determine to have an unaltering a resolution in the field. Sorry, as unaltering a resolution in the field. Though you may pray that it may have a happier outcome. And not contented with ideas derived only from words of the advantages which are bound up with the defense of your country. Though these would furnish a valuable text to a speaker, even before an audience so alive to them as the present. You must yourselves realize the power of Athens and feed your eyes upon her from day to day till love of her fills your hearts. And then when all her greatness shall break upon you, you must reflect that it was by courage, sense of duty, and a keen feeling of honor in action that men were enabled to win all this and that no personal failure in an enterprise could make them consent to deprive their country of their valor. But they laid it at her feet as the most glorious contribution that they could offer. For this offering of their lives, made in common by them all, they each of them individually received that renown which never grows old. And for a tomb, not so much that in which their bones have been deposited, but that noblest of shrines wherein their glory is laid up to be eternally remembered upon every occasion on which deed or story shall be commemorated. For heroes have the whole earth for their tomb. Awesome. And in lands far from their own, where the column with its epitaph declares it, there is enshrined in every breast a record unwritten with no monument to preserve it except that of the heart. These take as your model. And judging happiness to be the fruit of freedom and freedom of valor, never decline the dangers of war. For it is not the miserable that would most justly be unsparing of their lives. These have nothing to hope for. It is rather they to whom continued life may bring reverses as yet unknown, and to whom a fall, if it came, would be most tremendous in its consequences. And surely to a man of spirit, the degradation of cowardice must be immeasurably more grievous than the unfelt death which strikes him in the midst of his strength and patriotism. Comfort, therefore, not condolence, is what I have to offer the parents of the dead who may be here. Numberless are the chances to which, as they know, the life of man is subject. But fortunate indeed are they who draw from their lot a death so glorious as that which has caused your mourning, and to whom life has been so exactly measured as to terminate in the happiness in which it has been passed. Still, I know that this is a hard saying, especially when you will constantly be reminded by seeing in the homes of others blessings of which once you also enjoyed. For grief is felt not so much for the want of what we have never known as for the loss of that to which we have been so long accustomed. Yet, you who are still of an age to beget children must bear up in the hope of having others in their stead. Not only will they help you to forget those whom you've lost, but will be to the state at once a reinforcement and a security. For never can a fair or just policy be expected of the citizen who does not, like his fellows, bring to the decision the interests and apprehensions of a father. While those of you who have passed your prime must congratulate yourselves with the thought that the best part of your life was fortunate and that the brief span that remains will be cheered by the fame of the departed. For it is only the love of honor that never grows old. And honor it is, not gain, as some would have it, that rejoices the heart of age and helplessness. Turning to the sons or brothers of the dead, I see an arduous struggle before you. When a man is gone, all are wont to praise him. And should your merit be ever so transcendent, you will still find it difficult not merely to overtake, but even to approach their renown. The living have envy to contend with while those who are no longer in our path are honored with a goodwill into which rivalry does not enter. On the other hand, if I must say anything on the subject of female excellence to those of you who will now be in widowhood, it would be all comprised in this brief exhortation. Great will be your glory in not falling short of your natural character, 
and greatest will be hers who is least talked of among the men, whether for good or for ill, bad. Here's the last little bit. My task is now finished. I have performed it to the best of my ability, and in words at least the requirements of the law are now satisfied. If deeds be in question, those who are here interred have received part of their honors already, and for the rest, their children will be brought up till manhood at the public expense. The state thus offers a valuable prize, as the garland of victory in this race of valor, for the reward both of those who have fallen and their survivors. And where the rewards for merit are greatest, there are found the best citizens. And now that you have brought to a close your lamentations for your relatives, you may depart. Wow. So I know that that was a little long, listener. Can we, do we want to review really fast kind of what, what sure. went down? So basically, he started off saying, uh, speeches aren't great because if I screw this up, you all be really mad. And then he goes on to sure. describe the laws of the country and then the way of life of the country. Like what these men believed in, what they were dying for. Here is a sketch of what, what, where they came from. And then he discusses the merits of valor and the men themselves and then addresses the remainder, right? If you can still have kids, you should have kids, right? You should bring the concerns of a father to every state yeah. conversation. If you are yet a brother or a son, you are going to be looking up to your dad and trying to, or looking up to your big brother and trying to meet that same glory. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tough. If you're already super old, well, you've got honor there and all of their kids, the, the kids that were left from the dead are going to be brought up by the state at mm -hmm. the expense of the state, right? Because that is the reward of someone who's fallen in battle. Um, that's kind of the gist of it. I love it. I mean, sure, it's setting a high bar. And I don't know if we're going to talk about that. So again, one of Graham and Mai's first comment in this was to question that part about uh, the Athenians actually being good at battle. And I guess historically... Yeah, we were being a little snarky. Yeah, but... I feel shame. Well, you sh well then I do too. I don't know. Like, does that mean something that our first reaction to it is to they critique, lost. to pull apart? Yeah, yeah. yeah, to say, actually, he's wrong. Uh, I kept thinking throughout this about uh, the, our recent episode on Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, that what Pericles is doing is setting this really high bar that in all likelihood, no one actually lived up to 100% of this, or mm -hmm. no one could live up to 100% of this. But to have it as a goal still meant you did better than the majority of people who wouldn't have a target like this. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So what strikes me out of this is that the Athenians seem to have a clear national identity. Yes. Yep. Right. Good looking, but simple homes. Uh, wealth for use, not for talk or ostentation. Um, cultivating the mind was healthful. Without loss of manliness, or right. in this translation, without, effeminacy. without effeminacy. You have discussion before valor, right? Like valor should spring from a place of ease and rest and consciousness and really knowing the dangers and yet standing up to them anyway, rather than being ignorant of them and running blindly in, right? I, I think about this national identity, which by the way, he talks about not wanting to overdo or underdo. So while it may be setting a pretty high bar, I think there probably would have been a lot of people in that town who held the, these as values, right? Who could say, yeah, that is, he is talking about our city, the place we love. So what, what is ours? What is our national identity? Austin? Can you say, no, no, the U.S., can you say the same things? Is it easy to pick out a series of values? Hardworking. I think most of our narratives are around people with nothing, still accomplishing uh, great success, starting yeah. businesses, creating industry. So Self-sufficiency, yes. representative government. Yep. Um, I mean, you guys, so for you listeners out there, uh, I am Canadian having married an American and immigrated to the United States, you guys have an easier sense of understanding a national identity because as a country, you are an, you know, you're essentially an idea. You have a constitution. You have a, you didn't just sort of exist in a land for a long period of time like England, right? Like England can trace its, its heritage back to, you know, before history and mm -hmm. say like, well, there's always been people, you know, the Anglo-Saxons who've been living here. Um, so you have you 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 have a founding document as a country. Uh, very few places have that. Even Canada, which is also an immigrant nation, doesn't have that same kind of um, 
that same kind of national identity. But it's one thing to have a national identity. It's another thing to have it reinforced through daily life. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then also sort of change as time goes on. Um, I think we are all raised on the story of, of, of lionizing like the greatest generation, right? Like we, we were all raised lionizing the World War II generation as men and women who value, you know, who knew what America was and understand her values and were willing to die in the fields of Europe uh, to protect freedom. Um, I don't know, I just couldn't help but sort of, as Pericles is talking, the like imagery that's flashing through my mind is that of like World War II. Because that to us is, is also right. is that kind of lionized um, uh, era and people and, and like be like this generation, like you know, uh, live up to the, this generation's mm-hmm. standards of, of, of existence. Yeah. I don't know. It strikes me that most of our national narratives are individualistic, mm-hmm. right? You can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, start a business, go from nothing to something. Like there's very little community narrative there you know what i mean I, I like he talked about <clears throat> he talked about the, the athenians even sorry <clears throat> even balking from giving giving each other unkind looks which aren't against the law but make everybody feel grumpy yeah <laughs> a piece of that might be so i'm just googling population numbers for athens around this time and th- this is only the first result so it might not be right somewhere around 140,000 people are in athens 40,000 men who are citizens and 40,000 slaves, which would leave 60,000 who are women, I think is if my if they were, right. if and so, is this like when he gave the speech? Yes. 432 <clears throat> BC and the younglings so just, just sure. Uh, you're right. So women and children make up that last 60,000 just to say that it was so much. So t- to compare Athens to the United States somewhere, you know, 350 million people mm-hmm. that I think it gets very difficult to have, those narratives for such a large number of people. So mm. I've, I've thought a while about doing an episode on the idea of the polis, which is what a part of what you're getting at that uh, the polis was a small, it's, I mean, translated, it just means city, but there's something to the small size of it. If I was actually prepared for this, I would have the quote in front of me, but there's, uh, I think it's an Aristotle quote about the size of your polis should be no larger than a loud man speaking can hear. So right. like, like literally a contained physical unit. And in that small of a community, you can have uh, shared virtues, you can have shared values. And that's a lot easier than saying all 350 million people are going to agree on something. Is that? Yeah, that's fair. fair. It's a bummer, but or yeah, it's a bummer, but I think size has to play into how we understand this. Oh, totally. Do you think that we as cities perhaps have more of an identity? I think the smaller community you can get to, the more likely you can have, the, the more easily you can have an identity. We've talked before. I think you see it in companies. There it is. For good or for ill. Sure. Like, I think you see it in corporations, corporate identities, and people buying into that. Yeah. Um, I think we see it in schools. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Colleges and families. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So often it'll get tied to a thing called Dunbar's number, which is the number of people that I might have talked about this before. Please stop me if I have. That, that there's a number of people. Stop. That, I'm just kidding. You that, haven't talked about this before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, I, that there's an, a, a number of people that you can actually have relationships with, mm-hmm. and that number is somewhere between 150 and 200 people. And so Gore-Tex, somewhat famously, the company that makes like uh, waterproofing stuff for mm-hmm. your boots, whenever they hit 200 people, they'll open a new like physical building because you can't know people beyond 200. You mean a new – like in their, in their corporate headquarters? Corporate, yes. Yeah. So like instead of everyone being in one giant – so think of the Apple building, yeah, which yeah. is like a spaceship. Mm-hmm. So instead of that where everyone's in one building, it's separate buildings for each of those 200 groups of people. Mm-hmm. That was – as yeah, I think the last time I read about this was 10 years ago, so they might have changed since then. Same thing with churches, right? If you're church, doing church plants, church. once you hit – there's, you know, that critical mass of people. Once you hit it, it becomes a different entity of, yes. uh, you know, once you hit sort of 250, 300. Where um, you're no longer knowing people as they're coming. That's right. But you're also probably attracting a different type of person who, I don't want to overstate this, but oh man, I, I guess I'm never going to do this episode because I'm talking about all this stuff now. There's this thing called an adoption curve in business and the adoption curve tracks the type of person who is trying a product out at different stages in the, in the life of that thing. So there are certain people who are attracted to new things Mm -hmm. and want to be engaged and try new things, even if they're kind of broken. 
and those are early adopters, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. The beta testers. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. But like they're okay with things being broken, but that's not most people. Most people want a thing that's already working. Mm-hmm. And so that's what you're getting at with once a – once a church gets to a certain size, people join because it's popular, mm-hmm. not because they want to actually be engaged in that community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in the same way, if we were to go and start a new city right now, and we picked 150 or 200 people, they would be like – That sounds sold, awesome. It doesn't – but so – and they, were, they would be sold out on what we're doing. They would want the kind of institutions we would want. Email us at classical stuff yeah, at veritasacademy.net if you want to start the new polis. Is it's, this where we start our commune? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm so down for this. It's going to be an offshore – there it uh, is. Floating city. <laughs> Ooh, dibs on leader. P- Peter oh, no. Thiel, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> Good. This is going to be our libertarian paradise. But, what, but once we start that city and then we start having some success in that city, because of course it would be successful, then people would start coming who aren't there because they want to try a new thing. They're there because it's successful. Or because of the, our free ice cream policy. There it is. They, there would be mm-hmm. some other reason other than we want to try a new thing. And that would dilute, that would change the character of the city as it gets larger and larger. Yeah. I think definitely there's something to the fact that Athens being a city of of you know 100,000 people means that and you can 40,000 ha- citizens. 40 yeah, 40,000 citizens means that you can have this sort of deep but not so wide community of like-minded individuals and that when you stand up and give a speech about men who had died for it, it's going to have a lot of resonance whereas um um, you know, I, I think you, you see this when uh, great sports figures retire for a team, or for for a college. Like there, you know, people um, feel like he was one of them, and they are one of him, and that they are sort of this family and community. But when you get to bigger and bigger entities, um, when you work for a giant major corporation that's got you know sixty thousand people global, or and then you know the unfortunate truth is if you ha- yeah when you have a giant nation of 350 million people, uh, it's harder for that um, identity to um, really sort of sustain itself or to, or for, or for some even to mean anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is why in Texas, like people get more like geeked up about the state of Texas. Like mm-hmm. we were once our own country out here all this, all the time. And like, you know, you find little lone stars on the bridges. If you right. guys don't know this, if you've never been to Texas, it is a different place. Yes. My, they, it's it's weird it. because it's the, everything's bigger. The trucks are bigger. The cups you get at restaurants are like three times the size of normal. And they even have ads that cater particularly to Texas. Like yeah, yeah. DQ has a different jingle here than it has in other, all other States. And I, like other, other things have jingles just for Texas. There's such a strong Texan state identity yeah. that they like big corporations will pander just to this and not necessarily anywhere else. My wife's not the biggest, like she is not a, you know, Texas forever kind of person. Um, uh, when we were living in Holland. So Texas, like just for a while, but I mean like, like she loves her, she loves Texas, but I mean, not in the way that anyway, anyway that's not the point of the story, but when we were <laughs> even abroad and people would ask her where they're from, they would say, oh, where are you from? And I would say, I'm from Canada. And they're like, oh, cool, I love Canada. And then they say, where are you from? And she would never say I'm from the U.S. She'd say I'm from Texas. Texas right. But if you ever bumped into anybody from like Arkansas or Idaho, they would say, I'm, I'm from, from the, the U.S. US. They wouldn't say like, oh, I'm from Arkansas. Yeah. Um, it's just, there's, anyway. So maybe, maybe, yeah. So Texas has done something to be able to keep that national identity. But again, it's 20, 200, 25 million people. That's a big, a lot of that's people. a big group of people. So, um, so even that you're saying is too large to have... An identity? Apparently not. Right. There, mm, sure. But is Austin a different city than Dallas or Houston oh, even? Yes. So then, <laughs> but then is the or Veritas, Killeen. but then is the Veritas community different than name another school community? Like as we. In go, Austin or another school community? I mean, it doesn't, we don't do In Austin, names, let's just but, say. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. That we would have a different, we would think that we would have a different type of character than another school, but it's not to say better or worse mm-hmm. in the same way that if we were to read AJ, I know you really love the Spartans also, and I don't know if we have as many of their writings because they probably didn't write as much, but right? <laughs> they tended to hurt things right, more than write of, about things. But there's also a dignity in Sparta, and it's not to say that like Athens is necessarily better all the time. Objectively, they're not because they lost a war, mm-hmm. but there are different values in both, and if you're going to fit in, if you're going to succeed, you need to take on those values in whatever community you're in. 
So I'm not even, I'm not trying to call out other private schools. I'm just saying there will be different things that we value than others. And it's just because we've made a choice for one, one set of values versus another. You, would you die for Veritas, Thomas? I mean, uh, probably not, but I, I like working here. Die for it? That's crazy. Well, I mean, what scenario in which do, does me dying save the entire school? Hopefully none. Yeah, hopefully none. Yeah. Yeah. So all that to say that I think the smaller you the, the smaller the community you get to, the more specific you can be on those values. Mm-hmm. There are American values, but totally, uh, what, what, it just it means something that we're pointing to seventy years ago as like the most recent thing that we can say. This is a thing that unites us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my other thought when reading this is the integral role that at least right now for the Athenians, war is playing in the way that they think about their life. So they, they cherish their national identity in part because that national identity is in peril yep. and because they have personally or they know someone very close to them who has fought to preserve it. And I know that we have servicemen and service women, but it seems like, like the common citizen is less invested. I mean, I know they're less invested than the Athenians were, mm-hmm. right? There was a high probability that those 40,000 dudes had to be part of the army yep. because they, they needed it and they had to know why they were there and what they were fighting for. And it's just interesting how how buy-in to a country, to a place, to an ethos changes as it becomes less and less imperiled. Like, maybe we feel less engaged with our national identity in part because I don't personally have to defend it. So I'm less committed to making it awesome. Isn't this the villain's, like, uh, uh, plot in The Watchmen? Isn't he like, we'll bring world peace if we can just have some sort of Oh, outside, common enemy. Some outside enemy, threat right. come and threaten humanity. Yeah. and so I like, think this has been in, like, a couple Marvel movies, yeah, too. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is Ozymandias' like, plot in The Watchmen is to bring the giant squid monster to destroy Earth. Uh, or to destroy part of Earth to com- to unify Earth in uh, in a common enemy. Oh, this is also the plot of a Kurt Vonnegut book. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah, the, he this guy gets flown to the moon, and the moon is going to revolt against the Earth. <laughs> to Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, is that Kurt Vonnegut? It's, it's not. Kurt it's Vonnegut, not Slaughterhouse. It's not I think no, it might. I don't think it's Sirens of Titan. It might be Sirens of Titan. Um, in any case, he gets flown up there and finds out that it's all just a big sham it's like a, a lie be, basically their army is designed to fail and what's going to happen is the moon revolts goes against the earth the earth wins a decisive victory and it unites the entire earth yeah. so sacrifice 300 men for the case yeah. you know for this and they're just going to blow it all over the movie screens all over the place mm-hmm. and make it seem as though earth has you know united under this common enemy but, but like you know doing it with a lie seems not ah, different it seems different than doing it um, than these men who are dying for not a lie. They're dying for the thing that they actually that is actually happening. Um, anyway, but yeah. So the, the, no, I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying we should go out Make and up. start some wars right. or put ourselves in peril. It's just interesting how. But they're going to be buying in different ways. You don't. It doesn't yeah. have to be an existential threat. Like we even. I think you even see that in a school. Like a student body. If we want to have students buy into the school, they need uh, and care about the the place what they're at. Not that we need to, well, maybe that we instill in them that it can fail if they don't buy in, but but also give them some kind of buy-in to the way that the school exists. Um, I say physical labor, but... <laughs> but the thing is with our school is that I would say it is adversarial, right? We set ourselves up at least a little bit counterculturally. Sorry, we, our school is adver- adversarial to culture at large? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I know we sure. we discuss a lot of things about movies and Facebook and the way that we live in the world, and it is definitely counter to the common cultural message to how to live in the world. I guess that you're, I, you're onto something there, that we there is an enemy, but it's not made up. Like, we do genuinely think that... I've been talking with lots of students this last week. Facebook funded... This was, a year, this was years ago. Facebook funded a study about the happiness of people who use Facebook and they found that the more you use Facebook, the less happy you are. Yeah. Like the, well, or they found a correlation between unhappy people and Facebook use and greater use. Sure. Either way, spending lots of time on Facebook isn't great. It either shows you that you're not a great person or it's causing you to not be a <laughs> either. Person. You're already sad right. or so, it's making you sad. So either way, don't, don't, don't <laughs> well, you're already sad. Yeah. You found your tribe, right? Or, <laughs> you're, you're onto something, but yeah. So y- yes, there are still enemies. There's an enemy there, but it's not made up. It's actually something we believe. This feels a lot like abolition of man, that we're not just saying you should value war because we need people to eventually fight wars for us, but there's actually a dignity that Pericles is getting at in the in this talk. I don't yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. So yeah. maybe what's what's the lesson here? Is it set a high standard? Well, the set a high standard for yourself and figure out what values you want to stand for in the world. I mean, that seems like real basic stuff that we could have. You know, I, I like is that is that a little it's, too but cheesy? His is, but his is specific. It's not just set your own. It's that yeah. as a group we as set a the group standard. of people we find a group that yes. has the standard. So, yeah, because you could not be the kind of person he's talking about just yourself, yourself. Yep. or even just one family. One family can't go off and do this by themselves. It, it is this uh, a group of people um, coming together and and setting this standard, living by this standard and, and continuing the standard. And like that message is a pretty, I think it's a hard one in the modern world. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah. In terms of, of, of close knit, deep communities, we do not like, we are a fractured, um, um, sort of culture, right? Just think of how many, well, I'm even an, an example. Like I grew up in Canada and here I am living in Texas. Like I'm not living in the place where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Um, I came here and, and modern technology and means that like the sting of living far away is lessened because I can Skype back with the people I love and I can fly back for Christmas. And, and so the modern technology has meant that uh, I, I don't have to make those stakes, but those things, but there are things definitely lost by being so mobile and so, and so mutable. Um, but we've wanted that, but we found that that mutability and that mobility has been financially advantageous to our way of life, but it has had these hidden costs that I think we haven't really taken into consideration. And that's these deep communities. Um, I'm always heartened every once in a while. I, I try to find out if there are actually these communities that have completely bucked um, these trends and are, are, you have these communities that are rallying around principles more often than not. And you find them around monasteries. I was going to say the Amish. I don't yeah, know if that, the Am- yeah, you find them around, uh, you know, the Amish in Pennsylvania. There's that, um, community that's built up around that monastery in Oklahoma. Do you remember what it's like? I don't Clear Creek, something like that. Yeah. Um, there is a small town shoot. Oh, I can't remember what it is. I think it's Western Pennsylvania that, um, basically, um, it was a Catholic school, and they decided that they were going to do the sort of Catholic school in a specific way, and it kind of revitalized this small town, and all these old traditional Catholics that wanted this old traditional way of education moved to this town and have um, um, sort of transformed this town in, in, in and around this community of school, around this shared principle. So oftentimes you see it under shared religious principles because the, um, those are um, – Firm and unquestionable? Yeah, yeah, for the people that adhere to them, um, less so than, um, like when you read, when we were reading um, this with Pericles, when he was talking about, uh, shoot, I I can't remember, I'm sure I highlighted it, but I, uh, he was just talking about, um, um, there was one moment where he, he said, we can do what we want. Um, uh, unlike the Spartans that like, look at people funny when they do something different, we are allowed, we do things differently and like, we're okay with it. And I was just thinking to myself, like, that's kind of the libertarian fantasy is that a group of people are going to get together and people can do what they want as long as other, everybody else doesn't bother them. But I don't know how realistic that is. I also don't think he totally, I think that means something different to us reading it than it meant to him. He, he, he totally, en- he ends the talk, uh, the speech with. The second to last line, and where the rewards for merit are greatest, there are found the best citizens. Yeah. So they still had a moral language to say, sure, even even if it was the libertarian fantasy you're talking about, where you can do anything you want to, they still said, these things we reward and these things we don't. Yeah. Oh, so it sounded that, like they still had like shame, shame on people who didn't do, who were, weren't holding upholded, upholding the the morals of the of the the group. Yeah. That's another great question: is what? how are we? rewarding as a nation our citizens do we reward our worst citizens do we how, re- how, how do we reward our best ones I mean, like socially we, re- we definitely reward popularity and can um, you can you name one war hero of the last 10 years um the guy who just won uh john mccain uh, john mccain's a great answer but oh you're saying a good who's, answer. who's there was a guy who's just Anyway, I, I don't know him for his uh, him being a war hero. I know him because he was made fun of on SNL. I don't know if you heard about oh, this. Yes. The guy who lost yeah. an eye in mm-hmm. combat. Anyway, that was the guy I was thinking. Do you remember his name? But how no, many do you see. know just because they're war heroes? Not many. Right. Right. And that's, I don't know. I feel b- bad about that. 
like how how we as a nation reward our citizens for their efforts like even even the men who might be cha- trying to change it from the inside as politicians like the chances of the rest of the populace respecting them are low yeah yeah and on that happy <laughs> note uh we should draw things to a close hey thanks for listening i promise that's the last time i read the entirety of something on uh it is one of the greatest speeches of all time is, i can't think of anything time. right Better the, the other, other than us, are you guys like, okay with it? I always feel like off, reading too much online. Like that's a cheat. Like I'm, I'm no, not. It's, it's it people is, like audiobooks you, or you reading it. The words that Pericles has here, they are wiser than anything we would say ourselves. So oh, even if there's some, there's sorry, some kid so out there that's gonna <laughs> listen, there's some kid out there that's gonna listen to this four times and just drink it up. And if you're that kid, this podcast is you. for you, buddy. Yeah. Godspeed, <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> they're they're, they're going to skip the last half of this, and they're going to listen to the part where Adrian just was reading it. Yeah. In that case, man, just pick up a book. Yeah, like, seriously. Get a book or audio tape. Also subscribe something. to the podcast. Hey, <laughs> we. this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. You can find us online at classicalstuff.net. You can find us on Twitter at classicalstuff, C-L-S-S-C-A-L, stuff. You can email us at classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. And just to preempt a classical thing I got wrong literally in this episode, the quote is from Plato that I was trying to quote. The ideal polis or city-state should be no bigger than the sound of a crier's voice can carry. It's called a shoutocracy. Shoutocracy, <laughs> yes, that is. Is it really? No. No, of course oh, not. No. I was like, is that a term? <laughs> Which sounds awesome, but it's not a thing. Um, what, are we, what are we doing next week? Is there is there like a little bit of Am homework that our, no. our, our listeners it's should do or anything they should look into? Nah. No, I don't. We're going to talk about how we're snobs. Basically, yeah. That's probably the best way to Ooh. preempt it. We're going to question the entire conceit of this podcast, so no big deal. Can I wear a suit? You can absolutely or a wear monocle. a suit. All right. Or both. Thanks. Right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.